Hello there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right and a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. What's good, Alaska? This is Scott Levesque, and you're listening to the daily edition of the Must Read Alaska podcast. That's right. We're coming at you five days a week, Monday through Friday. And today, today is something new. Uh, as we've told you before, we are going to have a podcast for me and Suzanne, our fearless leader, Downing, is going to be joining for a, a more of a late week edition that we have here. And I'm really excited. But before we even get started there, before she jumps on and we talk about some of the the wonderful things happening in Alaska and locally. What I want to do is just ask you if you just take a second and give us a five star review. You know that you want to do it because it makes you feel good. We know you want to do it because you love this content and really it helps. And again, I'll tell you all about it search engine optimization. It helps us in the rankings and it helps people find the topics that we discuss on a daily basis. And if you want to do yourself just a little bit more of a favor, if you want to have an extra gold star today, go ahead and give us a written review. You guys have been overwhelmingly positive. It's been amazing to see all of the comments that have been given. And we just want to continue to provide the content that you like and want to know about. And that seems to be the case. So again, if you have a minute, just give us a five-star review. I think we're about 88 right now, 12 away from 100. And that's our goal before the end of the year. And if you want to go that extra mile, go ahead and give us a written review. We love reading them and we love hearing from our listeners, readers, and supporters. Well, let's dive into Suzanne. Thank you for joining with me today. It is great to be on your show. You know, usually we we I, I do the Monday show, and now all, you're, you're doing the other days of the week. And I am more than happy to be your guest, and you do such a great job. So thanks for having me. I appreciate that. And listen, there's a lot going on. You have been extremely busy, as everybody knows. You are a content machine, particularly with stories. And today is no exception. We've got a lot to talk about. So let's dive right in, and let's talk a little bit about sort of a story that's rehashing maybe a little deja vu for people. And that's the fact that ballot signatures seem to be getting rejected by the municipal clerk. And, and let's just talk about this one story you wrote today. And if you're not familiar with it, obviously go to Must Read Alaska. It's under the title, Was Your Ballot Signature Rejected by the Municipal Clerk? Time running out to fix that. Do you want to give us a little bit of a background on this, uh, Miss George, and, and kind of what's going on there? Right. Well, for for those who are not in Anchorage and aren't aware that there's a special election going on, the, the special election ends on October 26th. And this is only for District 4 Anchorage, which is a municipal district that re stretches from Rogers Park down to Abbott Road and then um, over to C Street and up through parts of Spinard and Northern Lights Boulevard. It's a big chunk of Midtown. And there are people in Midtown who want to recall Assembly member Meg Zalatel, who's one of the very hard right members. I mean, she's a hard left member of the Anchorage mm. Assembly, very hard left. And she, actually, she's the author of the uh, the mandatory compulsory masking ordinance. But um, that that is a, a mail in only election. So you're going to get your ballot in the mail. I think they, they mailed out 36,000 ballots to that district. And there were a um, number of, there were at least two or 3,000 ballots that went out of state, believe it or not. They mm. went to uh, to addresses in Washington state and other states. And in the survey that we've done, looking at those ballots that went out of state, by the way, it's a little bunny trail. A lot of those people, uh, a majority of those people are now registered in other states to vote. So we've, we've got an, an eye on those ballots, make, making sure that the, those ones don't come in because those are not legitimate. But about 7,000 ballots have come in, about 7,100 ballots have come in. But not everybody's ballot is getting counted. Some people are getting their ballots kicked back to them in the mail. And a woman received her ballot um, yesterday back from the municipal clerk saying, your signature doesn't match. Now, this woman is a lawyer. And she has voted, she's a super voter. She has been voting for years in Anchorage and she's not young, she doesn't, she's not messing around with her signature. She has the same signature she's had her whole life. And she was really appalled because when she got the letter back 
Scott, she um, she thought it was junk mail because it has this sort of look, junky look about it. Council Municipality right. says it says urgent on it, but you get a lot of stuff in the mail that says urgent must. You know, you've you've been a publisher's clearinghouse winner or whatever. And right. if, you're, if you're getting a lot of stuff in the mail, you could very easily miss it. So this is a real a real lesson for people, Scott. If you um, vote, if you vote, you only can vote by mail. Now you can go down to the Lusac Library during hours, uh, you know, regular business hours, and they say that's a, a place where you can vote in person. That is really not true. You're going to, to get a ballot there from them. You're going to fill it out, and then you have to go outside to the Dropbox and put it in the mail. You have to put right. it in, in the Dropbox. You are not actually getting yourself verified there. So all ballots are going through this process where you might get your signature kicked back, and you might not be able to fix it in time. My advice to people is, if they get a letter from Barbara Jones, who's the municipal clerk, who only seems to want to kick back Republican ballots, then what you need to do is you need to go down to her um, to her office at Ship Creek, and it's um, it's down there on East Ship Creek Avenue. Uh, I believe the number is six one nine East Ship Creek Avenue. You need to go vote in person, and you need to record it because there is so much nonsense. We saw this go on in April. We saw people try to cure their ballots and be rejected a second time. And we wrote a story about that in April about this guy that we called Sig Signer because he, he didn't want his name known. Today, we have somebody who doesn't mind having her name known. Her, it's Jamelia George. And she's a, a resident of um, College Park. And she was just appalled that her signature wasn't accepted because I don't know, what do you think about this, Scott? Well, uh, the question I'd have, and, and maybe this person doesn't want to, is this, do we know for a fact, and is she okay divulging what she voted, how she voted? Or do we not uh, know? She, she told me that she voted to um, to recall Meg Zalatel. Well, go figure. Listen, you had mentioned it before, and you wrote a story back in April during the mayoral election here in Anchorage, and, and uh, I kind of told you, hey, let me get down to the election office and do kind of this live <laughs> That, that kind of took a life of its own a little bit. And, and here's, the, here's the problem. We talked about it in April and it's continuing now. Election transparency has been a topic since the 2020 election and, and more so at the federal level with the presidency, but it's trickling down into not only state, but local now elections. And this idea of mail-in voting, Again, it's another red flag to me. I, I am not sure why we went this route. I'm not sure why Anchors decided to go this route. But we're now having uh, question marks around the legitimacy of what's going on in the election office. I hate the fact that we're doing this. I'm not here to make anybody's job difficult. But I, we are here to provide the news and what's really going on. And when you see an overwhelming issue with transparency in the election side of things here in this town it, it just brings up why can't we do things fair transparent and have accountability and now you have a woman who's a lawyer so she's not just your average joe she's somebody who understands elections she understands legality who has voted as a super voter for years if you read the article you find this and there's also a, a picture you put in here suzanne about the letter mm -hmm. This person has voted for years using the same signature. Now, all of a sudden, it's an issue. And it just so happens this person voted to recall Meg Zelotel. It, there is no... Uh, so when you go and vote in person, what you do is you go in there and you show your ID. And I think ID is a good thing. And, they, and then you sign the register for your... Uh, you know, they, they have for your, for your precinct. You sign that register. Right. And, and they, they look at your ID. They, they sort of match it. They give you a ballot. You are good to go. In this way that we have, we have no way to verify it. And this, the sort of the signature is sort of the last gasp. You, you just have to um, hope and pray that they will take your signature because if they don't, what happens? You may go ahead and fix your ballot, you know, or you, you sign it and you send it back in. And like we saw in April, they could reject it again. And then by the time you get your rejection letter, it's way too late. So that's why you need to go down to Ship Creek. They're, they're very, very secretive about where this office is. They do not have it on the website very clearly. They don't want people to know where to go to vote it, to, to, you know, to, to actually cure their ballots. But it's 619 East Ship Creek Avenue, and it's uh, door number D. And if you get a letter from the municipal clerk and she says your signature is no good, I'd say take the time, go down and fix it.
Absolutely. And I think I think we need to do this. Not only that, but be aware of your mail, because when you have mail in voting, you receive your, your ballot in the mail, you receive any additional information in the mail. And like you said, everything looks urgent and you open it up and it's a credit card or it's, hey, you right. qualify for $50,000 in loans. And you're like, I'm not going to open this up. It, it just right. leads to disaster. Let's not beat this dead horse. Let's move on uh, as we talk about the English municipality. And obviously, one of the things that kind of hit the news was the fact that the Bronson administration decided to go uh, a different route when it comes to the chief equity officer that was set into place by the assembly back in the spring. It was voted on, and Austin Quinn Davidson was the acting mayor at the time. And they did this sort of nationwide search and found this gentleman by the name of Clifford Armstrong III. And this person was from Tacoma. And... Uh, was given, awarded the position at the time. And let's all just keep in mind, let's frame this. Austin Quinn Davidson was the acting mayor, not the elected mayor. The assembly sort of rushed and forced this uh, position through. And there was no, I guess for lack of a better term, this was the pick of a previous non-voted administration. Okay. Non, it was a non-elected administration, and she she Correct. sat in that seat for eight months. And people who wanted to have a special election, at least have an interim elected mayor, fought for uh, elections, and the assembly refused to have them. They instead installed her for eight months. And while she was in there, she did a lot of things, uh, including spend a lot of money. I got to tell you, she spent so much money that the Anchorage um, municipality is not it's not 18 million dollars in the hole like I thought it was it's closer to 36 million dollars in the hole I'll be doing a story on that but then she went ahead and hired this equity officer just weeks before she was uh, ready to like move back into her slot on the assembly and they knew what they were doing they were trying Absolutely. to prevent they're trying to prevent Dave Bronson from being able to hire his own person in that seat. Now, interesting in the ordinance they passed, they gave themselves the power. They only have the power um, over this, this person. Supposedly, he cannot be fired without the approval of the assembly. There is no position like this where you can't be fired without the approval of the assembly. Well, Bronson went ahead and said, you're, you're done. You're gone. I'm hiring somebody else. And he hired, he hired another person into that position. So I'm expecting very much that um, Clifford Armstrong is working his way up to some sort of a lawsuit and that actually the assembly may join him in that lawsuit as well. They have already uh, approved money to get an attorney to take on the separation of powers issues that they have with the mayor. And the irony in your last statement there is, is does not go uh, unseen or unheard. The fact that there, there is a now uh, a law firm that Ms. LaFrance is trying to get to hold and retain her to look at the policies, to look at the uh, different various aspects of the Bronson administration. And of course, this this uh, firing of Clifford Armstrong is definitely a part of that to try to get some sort of dirt on how to proceed with a lawsuit. I'm assuming. Would you agree? There's there's just no amount of money that this assembly won't spend. They're going to spend fifty thousand dollars minimum on this uh, on this law firm so that they can take the mayor to court over whether or not he has is entitled to hire his own people. Well, I got to tell you this. I have no uh, animosity toward this Clifford Armstrong. He seems like he's a nice guy. I would love to spend Thanksgiving with him. He seems like a really nice guy. But in, in, it, it bothered me when he he posted something on LinkedIn on his personal on his personal page, all professional page, really there, and it was a press release where he said, "This is why they fired me. They fired me because um, they fired me because I wasn't their guy, essentially." And he had all these reasons. Um, they, I submitted a, an affirmative action plan, and they didn't like it. As soon as I, I gave it to them, they fired me. Um, they don't like uh, the fact that uh, I'm the only person who competed for a national fair and free competition for my job, whereas they were elected. How dare them? Then he posted this crazy uh, cartoon of him being shown the door by three KKK Ku Klux Klan hooded people, people in hoods. And they are, sep they are you know, consider yourself involuntarily separated from the Anchorage Equity Office Armstrong. And so he's being fired by the KKK. Now, this is so offensive that 
I'm really shocked that the mainstream media and um, other for, other media out there allow this to go unchallenged. You remember a few weeks ago, uh, the people were in the Anchorage Chamber and they were holding up yellow stars. It was sort of in solidarity with Jewish people who were um, part of the of the Holocaust, and they were trying to indicate that mask force mask mandate is the first step toward sort of a fascist state. And of course, the, the left went nuts. It called them uh, anti-Semitic. It made up all these allegations about what that yellow star meant. It meant none of those things. It meant that they understood what happened in East Germany, in Germany during World War II or leading up to World War II. It didn't start with the gas chambers. It started with separating people and forcing people to do certain things. And the anti-maskers sort of see the, the mask as a form of repression. Well, I'm looking at this, this KKK cartoon and I'm just appalled. How do people get away with posting stuff like that without being challenged? Yeah, it was, it, first of all, the cartoon is, it was obviously made for him. So it wasn't, yeah. I mean, it has his name in it. So uh, we know the cartoonist, but here, here's something else I want to look at. So he gives four reasons for, for what he believes he was let go. In, in those four reasons, there's a couple different things I want to point out. Number one is that these are all typical standard work issues that happen. For example, I come up with a plan. I present it to my boss. My boss either likes the plan, doesn't like the plan, or sort of likes it but wants to see changes. That is a part of standard operating procedure, number one. Number two, to sit there and to say, well, and, and here's the words that were used and I find fascinating. The first word was, that was used was this. I have technical competency. What does that even mean? The word technical competency. Reason number two, I'll read the article. And in performing my duties, my obligation was to follow the municipal code. You will have to decide for yourselves whether technical competency and legal compliance are valued by this administration. I don't even know what that means. Technical competency? I mean, if you go to his LinkedIn page and look at it, it what, what does that even mean? In so a job like one. this, in a job like yeah. this, what does technical competency mean? I mean, this is, this is ludicrous. Absolutely. It just seems like I want to say things that you put two words together that make it sound really important. But but that's not the case at all. There's another thing called in, in the fourth reason he uses the same sort of verbiage, but in a different way. And he says this, that obviously didn't happen as he's talking about uh, the form in which the mayor viewed his office and said during the campaign, Bron uh, Mayor Bronson said, listen, I don't know why we're even going with this position. There's so many other things we need to be looking at but we're focusing on this. We have so many other issues, very high importance that we need to look at. He says, I don't know if I would necessarily think this position is necessary. Good. So, so it's a totally valid point of view. He was, he was campaigning on it and, no. and it's a view that's shared by probably most of Anchorage who wonders, you know, it's $115,000 a year. We already have a, an equal opportunity officer with the city. Why do we also need this uh, equity In officer? the middle of a pandemic when small businesses are losing their, their livelihood. Mm -hmm. He goes on to say this, this is my point. That obviously didn't happen, meaning he, the office, the, the job was not cut. So then he says, he has since named someone else significantly less technically qualified than myself. What th this idea that we just make up these words that are supposed to mean something, what is less technically qualified? The last thing I'll say about this is that this guy who, again, I don't know him. I've never met him. But the fact that he would then crap on the next chief equity officer who he has no idea about, doesn't know any of his qualifications. But in his mind, he's definitely not as, quote, technically qualified or doesn't have the, quote, technical competencies. I don't know what that means. I have no well, idea. I'll tell you what it means. I'll tell you what it means. If you're an engineer and you have passed your, your PE exam and you've got your professional engineer's stamp, you're technically more qualified than if you're um, the foreman out on a job. But if you're in the this political realm where you're looking at equity, which is a kind of a brand new word for um, redistribution of wealth. There's no such thing as technically more qualified in equity business. This is really just about how you move some people ahead faster than others because they are perceived to have been disadvantaged or 
underrepresented or underserved is one of my favorite words, underserved. I'm not sure what that means. I guess the government's supposed to serve serve you your dinner and you're underserved. But it's, well, um, I, yeah, he's, gonna, I mean, he's, gonna, I, he's working on a lawsuit. You know that, don't you? Absolutely. And here's the, here's the problem, okay? When I look at his LinkedIn page, he's got a master's degree in international and global studies. He's got a bachelor's degree in history. He's got some sort of like, you know, certificate in web development track and software engineering. And then he's got a bunch of uh, lynda.com certifications, mostly in either meeting management or uh, entry level IT stuff. So I don't understand where the quote technical competency comes from. And, and I don't know that. I, I guess I'm unclear what that means, but to then say that somebody who took who now has been put in that position doesn't have those quote technical competencies. It, this sounds to me like somebody who's upset that they moved themselves up from Tacoma, weren't given the, the full breadth of what's going on and then realized, oh, this administration wants to hire somebody that they want in the position, not a unelected official who placed me into the position. I mean, that's and, all I- and, and let's be clear, it wasn't him who moved himself up, it was the taxpayers. That because uh, because Austin Quinn Davison hired this particular person and because the assembly approved them, it was the taxpayers that moved him up. And it's probably about a ten thousand dollar move. I imagine that's that would be about in the range that you'd, you'd see you'd expect minimum for sure. Mm -hmm. yep. For sure. Anyway, it's just a story to watch on. Uh, but another interesting fact is actually outside. We There's another story you wrote that I think is really fascinating. And I know you've got some sort of on the on the ground boots on the ground news on this, which is. A story you wrote today, and it's under the heading, Yukon Flat School Superintendent says no teachers have not been fired yet over district's vaccine mandate. And to put a little bit of a background on this, there are teachers in the Yukon Flat School District that have decided that they are not going to get the vaccine. However, the, the district itself is saying that there is a mandate. They need to get vaccinated. And if they don't get vaccinated by the deadline, that there are repercussions for that. And obviously that looks to be termination, right? I mean, would you agree with that? Oh yeah. And and so what, what we're hearing from boots on the ground in the in the district. Now remember, this is rural Alaska, and rural Alaska is, you know, they don't have um, you know, they, they just it's the rumor mill. It's a rumor mill right. there that's, that's really active. But I'm hearing from a number of parents who said their children said their teacher was fired. And the kids don't want to go to school anymore. They're just so upset that their teacher was fired, that somebody went into the classroom in front of the children and pulled the teachers out. Now, what the superintendent is telling me is that they haven't been fired yet, that there is, they are entitled to due process. And they're having conversations with these teachers about why they're not va vaccinated. And there's, uh, there's seven to eight of them. We're not 100% sure on that. It's kind of a soft number, but we're hearing there's up to eight of these teachers it's one third of all the teachers in that district. Now, this is an intensely rural area part of Alaska. Right. It's, it's, it is about as Alaskan as you can get out there. It's places like Venati and Fort Yukon and Circle and Beaver and uh, you know Arctic Village. These are really, really rural towns. And, and the biggest school is in uh, Fort, Fort Yukon. There's like 92 students in the school. And the entire school district is only 200 and some students. It's not, a, you know, so we're not talking a lot of people and we're not talking a lot of teachers, 21 teachers. When you get rid of eight teachers, uh, 21, that's more than a third. Last time I did my, my fourth grade math. So uh, we've got a, a dispute. It sounds to me like the superintendent is saying, well, we're going to try to coach them back into to, you know, their job and, and make sure that we understand why they're not doing it. Maybe we can work with them. But in the meantime, the, the, the students, the parents, and people in the district are having a meeting today about this because they're very upset about they're losing these teachers. One of them, one of these teachers has been in the district for 13 years. I'm going to tell you, Scott, this is a district. Nobody stays for 13 years in these roles. They, they stay for one year. They stay for two years. These are really tough places to go and teach if you don't just embrace that whole feeling of wanting to live in essentially the wilderness in Alaska. Right. Well, what this goes to, and our listeners know this, I've been, I've been pretty, pretty uh, consistent when talking about the fact that a vaccine mandate is going to affect more than just the employed individuals. I mean, we're looking at it here in Anchorage. We're looking at uh, specific hospitals. We're looking at organizations that are, are beginning to uh, put their foot down and say, you're not vaccinated. You can, you can hit the, the door. Or as you've talked about in Providence, 
we're going to start to reschedule you and decrease your hours until essentially you're just not scheduled anymore. Um, but they do that, and to, they don't, and they don't call it firing you. They just say we're not going to schedule you anymore, but right, we won't. Right. But they they're they're managing you out. It's absolutely outrageous how they're treating. And you know what's going to happen with this? It's just going to be a huge uh, explosion of union activity. They're they're oh, yeah. they're create they're creating workers unions by doing this. Absolutely. But then you go to a place like the Fort Yukon, and and particularly the Yukon Flat School District. You're absolutely right. That, that's the salt of the earth people out there. Those are the people that love students, especially this teacher that you had written about that was there for over 10 years. I mean, that woman or that man, I don't know if it's a guy or a gal, loves that community out there. And, and with such a small student population and even a smaller teacher and faculty operation, that's a family atmosphere out there. So when you start letting those people go, it's not like you're just letting go uh, just another teacher from ASD or something like that that no no no. you're affecting an entire community which doesn't surprise me that a day after this there's already a community meeting to talk about what's going on because I'm sure those parents know how difficult it is to get teachers to teach their kids in that school in that school district and the fact that the school district would just say 19 you either have it or you don't you're out I mean that is going to cause ripple effects and and that this is not just the first school district that's going to happen to this is coming across the board here i mean the trend is this you're starting in california new york and it, people are latching on top of this stuff and frankly we've talked about this we've skirted this idea and thrown it out there there is very quite possibly a vaccine mandate coming down the pipeline i mean i i don't have any confirmed evidence of this or anything like that but as Anchorage and its left-leaning assembly begins to, to chameleonize and take on the identity of the Seattles, the Portlands, the, mm -hmm. the San Francisco's, they are taking a playbook right from those cities and implementing them in, in this case, Anchorage. And you're seeing that now. And it is, it's devastating. I mean, you wrote a story the other day about Washington State and what the governor did in terms of how many police officers and staff members on, the, on that force both as officers, sergeants, and captains, um, as well as support people, were laid off. Six percent of the Washington State Patrol was not laid off. Six percent of them were fired in the Washington State. That is a huge number since all of these forces, including Washington State Patrol and the Alaska State Troopers, they're always looking for people. They're looking for good people. Right. Well, I'm telling you, this is a really good opportunity for the Washington State Patrol uh, officers if they want to come up and they like hunting and fishing. This is a good opportunity to come up to Alaska because the, the state troopers have like 50 positions open. I think they they uh, they're always looking for people up here. Absolutely. So, again, this is just one of those things where I look at this and I go, man, um, this is, again, the divisiveness. We've talked about this, the separation already of the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated and this idea oh. of a growing divide. Well, you listen to what the superintendent of the uh, Yukon Flat School District said. She said, quote, I will say that we are meeting with each unvaccinated person in a private conference to figure out how to move forward. OK, interesting. You know, yeah. You know, we're going to meet with each of the unvaccinated people. That is those that's big separation language. You know, just try to plug in any other word, unclean person. We're going to we're going to the untouchables. With any untouchable, with any black person, with any uh, with any Muslim person, you, know, you know, plug in anything you want, and you're starting to separate people out because of something, which is yeah, it's pretty darn interesting. It, it's not going to get any easier as well, and and frankly, this is going to cause. I it's I don't see it getting any better, Suzanne. I don't see it getting any better. In fact, I see it getting worse. And as somebody who uh, sees people coming in daily to ask to find out what their options are as far as exemptions. What I hear is uh, there are some companies that are allowing this to happen. I mean, Delta is one of them for sure. You wrote an article about that, but there are some other companies who do not care what you have for an exemption. It's either abide or goodbye. That is pretty much it. Well, uh, go ahead. Did you have something else you wanted to, to add to that one? I don't think the story's done yet. I mean, we've we've had yeah. the first blow, we've had the second blow on it from you know the the superintendent says no, they're not fired, but they are in a status now. They are in a status where they are out of compliance with the with the district, and they are ha they're having conversations with the superintendent. It has upset the communities greatly. So we'll keep an eye on that one. 
yeah, it'll be interesting to see what a community, especially a community that close knit and, and small, can do to change some of these. Um, what I would say is 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 pretty some stark uh, restrictions on on their teacher base. But it, as we talk about Anchorage, one of the things that's really interesting is we have a mask law that has been passed, has it not? Uh, in the dead of night, it felt like we got the public was two times. Uh, they were they were co well. They were falsely led to believe that Wednesday was going to resume public testimony after six straight days. Well, I shouldn't say straight six days that were available for public testimony. They were the assembly said, yes, Wednesday at five o'clock, uh, they will resume public testimony. Uh, they wanted to get some of the quote, you know, business out of the way during their regularly scheduled Tuesday meeting. And then what ended up happening? Well, surprise, surprise, there was an a, a, emergency ordinance that was brought up and voted on that day which totally excluded any further public testimony it it shut down that and they passed it uh, of course it went to the mayor's desk mayor vetoed it very quickly and they had a special meeting to override that veto and they did so and now we're stuck with this mass ordinance however what i've noticed suzanne and i've been around town uh this is this has no staying power. I mean, it's very interesting to see uh, when we had these mass ordinance before under the emergency powers that were given to the mayor, there was considerable compliance with this. And what I'm seeing is not that much. And I think that's really hit the chair and the uh, vice chair, Ms. Suzanne LaFrance and then Mr. Christopher Constant, because they've sent a letter to the mayor demanding uh, that this mask law, this mask mandate be enforced or else again it's another setup it seems like for the mayor but what are you hearing what are you seeing out of this well it's very clear from the beginning that part of this was let's do this ordinance and then we know how this mayor feels about it he's going to say something stupid like i'm not going to enforce it which he has not said by the way and but they're they're hoping to trap him into saying that because if they do then what happens is that would be grounds for recall and because we are in a in a phase of our community life where recall is the big fashion in Alaska uh, they mm -hmm. would start immediately start a recall campaign because there are a number of people in Anchorage who do want that mask uh, ordinance they do want mandatory masks for so for those of us who don't think that's a good idea we might be you know, we might be under an illusion that a lot of people think that way, but in Anchorage, Anchorage is a very um, on the bubble city and a, a, about 50% of the people are would be okay with it. Quite honestly, I've seen some of the polling numbers and it, they're shocking to me, but, it, that it, but it's true. So they kind of know what the public thinks. And uh, at this point, it looks like they're hoping that they can start a recall against this mayor before he you know, has his three years of, of office. And in, in addition, we're seeing around town, I, I did post a, a big video. It's embedded in this story. So if people want to go look at the story. Assembly Chair LaFrance demands mayor enforce mask ordinance in Anchorage. Well, embedded in the story is a video that a guy took of himself in um, Barnes and Noble. And he wasn't wearing a mask. And there are so many loopholes to this mask law. All you have to say is I'm exempt. And they can't ask you why you're exempt. They're not supposed to do any of that. He, he just says, I'm exempt. So she calls the police. There's four police officers in there. He's being very calm. He's saying, you can't trespass me out of here. I am. A, this is a place that's open for business. You, you're, you say you're open to the public. I'm here to buy a book and I just want to buy my book. Well, half hour later, the lady says, I don't care what you say. Here's your trespass notice. You, you know, leave, don't come back. But it took four police officers, probably a good half hour, 45 minutes of their day. So you can imagine several hundred dollars worth of police time to go into Barnes and Noble because the, the manager of Barnes and Noble was so upset that this man didn't have his mask on. So it, it is being enforced in its own way. I am still um, asking uh, Amy Domboski to let me know how she plans to enforce it. And in fact, I'll give her a call today and I'll get uh, an update for you on the on the web by tomorrow okay awesome awesome that's great yeah i think so if you like you said the story is under assembly chair of france demands mayor enforce mask ordinance in anchorage two things i want to say number one that is absolutely true mayor bronson has not said he won't enforce it i think that's a uh interesting thing that it's got out because a lot of people on both sides of this conversation feel like he um that's been said and that's just not true 
It's the other true. thing they're, is they're putting, they're putting words in his mouth here. Correct. I, I think those who are for him and against this mask mandate want him to say that, and those against yeah. him and are for the mask mandate want him to say that, like you said. Yep. But everybody wants him to say that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's it's the first time everybody's been united on something. But <laughs> if you actually get a chance to look at the video, and it's fascinating. This guy uh, clearly knows not only what the mask law says, but also what federal anti-discrimination laws say, including right. trespassing laws. Uh, the police officers, I feel bad for these guys. I mean, they're in a no-win situation at all. Uh, the guy that was standing in the front in the beginning was just like, I, I, we're here. And but you then, couldn't see the look he, on his face because he had a mask on. But let me tell you, you could see the look in his eyes. And he's just like, yeah. he, he couldn't believe that he had signed up for this. Yeah, the still image says it all right now on the on the actual video, which is like, why am I having to stand here right now? This is such a waste of my time. But then it's really funny. He pans the camera over and there's there's an officer a little bit further in the distance. And he goes, are you here for the same thing? Almost to say, like, why is there more than one of you here around me? It, and at the end of the day, what ends up happening is fascinating. The manager says not only no, will they not check him out, but she hands him a letter which looks to be on corporate uh, letterhead. So just a little full disclosure, uh, I, little, I know a little bit of the inner workings of Barnes and Noble, and I guarantee you while the officers were around him talking, she was in the back with corporate asking for a trespassing letter to prove. Now, the funny thing is, is he's not actually allowed back in that store ever. He no. can't go back into Barnes and Noble. Yep. Now, when I had a friend who saw this video and, and this person said, you know what the guy should have done? is handed the book and the money to the officer and said, can you check out? I'll be outside. That would have been great. That would have been great. <laughs> that would have been wonderful. Yeah, yeah. But as, as like you said, you're going to, you're going to provide an update as to, as to enforcement of this mask law. But uh, you know, I think a lot of people are, like you said, I agree with you. I think we have a little bit of a bubble and we think everybody hates this mandate and that's just not the truth. There are people oh. that want this to, to, to be, um, implemented and, and enforced. So it'll be interesting to see down the road how this looks. But even in that idea of, of the public testimony, uh, many Alaskans, uh, excuse me, many Anchorage citizens, residents, municipality residents, got this interesting mailer in, um, I don't know, maybe a week ago, maybe a week and a half ago. It was about a an eight ago. and a half. I, yeah, a couple of weeks ago. It was a huge mailer. I got one. I kept it because I was like, who is this from? There was no identification. Uh, the only, the only uh, thing on there was a courtesy photography um, shout out to who actually took the photos. And, and it was really interesting. And I, and I had texted you. I said, where is this coming from? Because there was no identification on it. There was no way to tell who sent the mailer. The only thing that you could find was an actual postage number, which then would link to whoever that was. Well, you've done some great investigative reporting. This is why I love you and love working with you because you get down to the nitty gritty. And the group is called Alaskans for Posterity. And you and John talked about this on Monday. You, you kind of got into the weeds a little bit. And where we left it was you were going to do a little bit more research. So I don't want to take away because you know it and you've been doing the research, but you have. And you posted a story today for everybody to look at. And it's in the weeds, but it's fascinating. It's called Alaskans for Posterity Illegally Add activity links back to uh, Lotchfeld Strategies and Ship Creek Group, which you had a hunch it would. Can you give us a little bit of an update and kind of give us where you're seeing this thing going? Absolutely. Well, what what this is, is um, it's, it's political warfare. And basically, this is a group that's popped up and it's, it's, a, it's a secretive group. They're, they don't want anybody to know who they are and who's funding them. So they've got three puppets in charge of the group. These are people who are, you know, they're, they're not people who've really been involved in politics much at all, but they're the face of the group and they're supposed to sort of look like the normal people. But in fact, there's big, big money behind this. If you send a full eight and a half by 11, it's, it's about really about a nine by 12, I think almost is the size yeah. of that, that flyer. And it had, uh, it had all kinds of stuff in there. It had a picture of a guy with a, a yellow star and he, he kind of looked a little menacing. It wasn't a good look. Um, it had a picture of Bronson. It, uh, it attacked Jamie Allard, who's an assembly woman. 
And uh, it, it was basically attacking Save Anchorage, which is a, a group of citizen grassroots activists. And they're trying to, on in this flyer, they're trying to make uh, Save Anchorage look like a bunch of white supremacist Nazis and that type of thing. This is what they do. So I track it back and I find out that the, the radio ads that they had placed were placed, um, were air bombing uh, Mike Dunleavy. They were criticizing Dunleavy for something. Well, if you do that, if you criticize a, a candidate who's already announced, you've got to reveal, reveal your top three donors. And they did not do that. And so APOC has been advised by people that I've talked to. And APOC is, I, I think, in a complete alignment that these are illegal ads. The flyer is also illegal because Jamie Allard is an announced candidate and they attacked her. And so basically she's uh, gotten her act together and filed a, a complaint against the group, um, Alaskans for Posterity. So what's interesting about this is that the, the company that placed the ad is gone, the radio ad is Gonzalez Marketing. They share the same address as Lots Field Strategies. And so, as I said in, in, on Monday, lots of the people associated with Alaskans for Posterity also shared an address that was, um, a, it's, it's the physical mailing address for um, people who worked at the Ship Creek Group. So people at the Ship Creek Group, people at Alaskans for Posterity, the, the Lotsfeld Strategies Group, which is, he's a political strategist. He works for unions, he works for Democrats, and he works for Lisa Murkowski. Those are his three clients. He's made a mm -hmm. lot of money at this. He kind of lives in Portland mainly now. He's getting a little bit older. He knows what he's doing. And so does uh, John Henry Heckendorn, who came up to Alaska to work for, for Lotsfeld. And he ran a Andy Josephson campaign. And then he spun off his own company called Ship Creek Group. But these two guys are, are allies and they work closely together. So what we've now discovered is this all goes back to Jim Lotzfeld, who is a very crafty political strategist. But what he's going to find out is he's probably going to have to reveal his top three donors because they've got these two illegal ads that they've done and they're going to have complaints against them made. If not by the end of today, but by the end of tomorrow. It, it, it's fascinating. And like, like you said, this is this is a crafty group. The, the layers to get to what you found out took some time. I'm I mean, that wasn't, it, it wasn't an easy go. I know that when I sent uh, you the flyer and I said, there is no, how does this even happen? There is no indication of who sent the flyer out, why it was sent out, who's behind it, who's funding it. Uh, that kind of, you know, I'm sure you would have seen the flyer already knew about it, but it really went down this road. And it's fascinating how this is, is continuing to, to kind of unfold as it is. I'll be interested. Are you continuing to kind of, keep eyes on the story and, and do you feel like this is going to, is this going to be a bigger story that we get down or is this just something that you think this is tactics? Well, what I, what I think is that uh, Alaskans for Posterity needs to have the veil sort of pulled back. And so we know who they are because they are obviously going to spend a lot of money. There was a lot of money in that radio ad, tens of thousands of dollars in the radio ads played all over the state ten, uh, against Mike Dunleavy. And that mailer going to every household in Alaska, that was a big expensive mailer. That was tens of thousands of dollars as well, as well as they also paid for the Providence Hospital CEO to send a letter to every person in Anchorage supporting the mask mandate. And that letter uh, was underwritten by this Alaskans for Posterity. We have got to know who is behind it. So I will continue to dig and circle around them until we find out. And that's why we love you. Let me give people a little bit of an information here about the Ship Creek Group. I've been following this group for a while, even before uh, you know joining this incredible team at Muscle Alaska. I want to let you know what some of these this particular Ship Creek Group is behind in terms of campaigns, okay? Because I think it's important. Just some of the most notable ones: Ballot Measure One, Ballot Measure Two, Alaskans for Better Election, Berkowitz for Mayor. Okay, how about Gross mm -hmm. for U.S. Senate? Dunbar for assembly, Dunbar for mayor. Uh, let's go with Perez Verdia for assembly. Uh, we can even continue going on. We could talk about uh, Weddleton for assembly. These uh, spun holds for our state house, Rivera for, for assembly. These, this shit creek group is entrenched in very left leaning candidates and political ideas and policies. So I, I'm really interested to see as you, like you said, as you continue to, to move down the, 
the path of figuring out the story, what ends up happening because, um, wow, what a, what an interesting thing. And we talked about this before we got on air. This is such an in the weed story. It, it really is. is, but people love it because there's some kind of like sexy, like uh, house of cards slash, you know, um, uh, this is house of cards. This is house of cards. Yep. For sure. And, and, and yeah. And the, and the other thing is, is that, that, you know, everybody got the, the flyer and they said Americans for prosperity. No, no, no. It's Alaskans for posterity. And so this is pure trickery. We we know what they're up to. They're trying to fool people and people can be fooled. We've seen them. We saw people fooled and they voted yes on ballot measure too. What a disaster that was. But um, the the, most people out there in the world, they just don't pay attention to politics um, the way that I do or the way that you do. We pay attention to it every day. And you know, other people are going to soccer games, they're trying to live their lives, they're ordering pizza, they're, they're visiting their grandmothers, they're taking care of their kids, and they're, they're going about creating jobs for uh, Americans. And in the meantime, we try to study this stuff so that they don't get fooled, and hopefully we reach enough people and they won't get fooled. And that's, that is exactly why the listeners, donors, supporters, and readers love you, Suzanne. And I'm just a part of the fun journey. I, I really do appreciate it. Hey, Thanks for joining with me. And, and this is something I hope the listeners really uh, enjoy. You have a wealth of information and knowledge and background. And for me, I just sit here and rant every day. Uh, I try to give the news, but I rant because, you know, I'm, a, I'm from the New England. So that's what we do. But I do appreciate you coming on. And if you haven't yet, please, if you love the content, if you love the fact that Suzanne just continually pumps out a ridiculous amount of content and articles on a daily basis, we would love for you to be a part of Must Read Alaska by supporting us. If you can go to mustreadalaska.com and at the top right, there's a donate page. Every bit counts. And we are here because of your donations and your support. So I just want to want to encourage you, if you like this content and you want to see it continue, uh, let's do that. Let's let's support uh, this side of the, the, the story. Let's support this side of what we bring to you, which is the full rounded view of the news. And also, if you haven't had a chance, Go follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe to us on uh, YouTube and Rumble and Parlor and Twitter and MeWe. It's all under the handle of Must Read Alaska, one word. Well, Suzanne, thanks so much for joining with me today. Hey, it's been a pleasure. We'll see, we'll do this again. Absolutely. Well, until next time, Alaska, take care.